I wasn't originally going to do a background on the Blue Iris picture because it had turned out so well. I was worried I was going to wreck it. But one of my subscribers encouraged me to do the background and also share it with you guys. So that's what I've decided to do. There's a, look, a quick look at the first attempt at the background that didn't really work out. And so here is my second attempt uh, at the background. And I'm starting with sap green uh, is the color. And you can see me doing some strokes that run all the way from the edge of the flower petals to the edge of the frame or, you know, the edge of the piece of paper. And the reason for this should become clear as, as you watch the video. And what I was doing was I was breaking up that background into manageable chunks. So instead of worrying about doing all of the background all at once, if I made sure that the strokes and the lines that I was doing went straight from the petal to the edge of the framework, then I could break that background up into easy, manageable little sections that I could tackle, you know, a bit at a time without worrying about the whole thing. So you can see me using the chisel tip here, and that's deliberate because I'd used fine tips on the flower. I wanted to make sure in the background that I didn't get too detailed and too noodly about doing, you know, super detailed stuff in the background. So I wanted to keep it kind of a bit big, a bit chunky, maybe the idea that it could be a bit thick and blurry in the background to set it apart from the flower. So the way that I thought I could do this was to make sure that I forced myself to use chisel tips in the background. And this, this could have easily backfired because if you watch the earlier video, the one where I felt I did a fail, I was trying a similar kind of thing of using um, chisel tips in the background and it didn't really work. But, you know, this time around, I'd learned a few of those lessons, so I was kind of ready for some things to go wrong. So I was going to try really hard to make sure that it worked. So what you can see me doing here is using three markers so far. I'm using the sap green and I'm using also a nice bright green called emerald, which is a bit darker. And I'm also putting in some yellow highlights on some of these um, bits of grass, bits of leaves in the background. Uh, and I'm doing that with uh, Windsor Yellow Deep. And what you can see me doing is layering up. So I put on the sap green to give myself an idea of where some of these blades of grass and these leaves are. And then I'm layering more of those other three colors on top of it. And then when I get some sections, as you can see me working on now, it's like a section in between those leaves and those, those blades of grass. Then I can work on that little section all by itself without worrying about everything. So I put down a flat kind of base of uh, sap green in the background. Then I'm mapping out some slightly darker areas using the emerald and again just using the chisel tip here and uh, now I'm going to start adding some slightly darker areas using indigo and again this was deliberate to use indigo um, as a sort of blue shadow in the background because the flower itself was blue I wanted to make sure that there was some link between the greens in the background and the flower in the foreground and the way I decided to do that was to make sure that I was adding blue into the shadows in the background to give it that color link blue petals blue shadows Hopefully you've also noticed that what I'm doing is using sap green as my blending tool. I'm using the sap green to blend in and blend together the indigo, the bits of emerald that I put on, and also a little bit of the sap green that was on there originally. Now I'm going back in with a bit of the emerald and just using that to provide a kind of mid-tone between the sap green and the indigo. So my plan here is deliberate using the pigment markers. Um, when I use the colorless blender, what I find it does is it kind of dilutes the colors a little bit, which is something I don't want for the background. And the white blender makes them a bit paler. So I'm deliberately using my palest color as a blending tool so I can keep the colors in the background nice and fresh, nice and bright and vibrant without diluting them down, but also allowing myself to you know, blend them together so I haven't just got a very, very stark um, you know, just stroke after stroke next to each other without any blending. I wanted to have, you know, blended areas in the background. So you can see again, using a combination of sap green and also emerald in this section below this kind of grass reed. And I'm also going to use um, indigo then as the darker colors again. And once I filled in the kind of base color using sap green, how I'm using the emerald is I'm, I'm using that as I said, my mid-tone, my bit of sort of shadow blocking in where there will be kind of crossover reeds and blades of grass in the background, you know, and they're not all just shooting upwards. Some are sort of popping off towards an angle and towards a diagonal. So I'm using the emerald to kind of map in those kind of areas behind 
the blades of grass that I've put in so far that are basically like the foreground blades of grass. So I'm trying to put in the bits in the background that are crossing over behind. So it will give it depth and give it this feeling of, you know, things closer to us and things further away. Here you can see me breaking my rule a little bit because I was so worried I'd used like too much indigo on that sort of first bit that I did. So when I did indigo on this section, I started using the fine tip so that I wouldn't be applying quite so much of the dark shadow color in the background. And as you see me blending in those shadows using the sap green, then I'm not too worried because if I start kind of easy and slow with just a little bit of shadow from the indigo, if I find it's not dark enough, you know, in a couple of minutes when I think I've done that section, I'm like, nah, it looks too light still. I can go back in and I can add some more indigo. Whereas if I was doing loads of indigo right away, it's a bit more difficult to sort of take that off the paper and to correct that mistake of having done it too dark. So I've gone a little bit closer here, so hopefully you can see a bit more clearly what I've been talking about, what I've been describing so far. And so I'm laying down that sap green base, and then you can see me putting in the shapes of reeds and grass in between those um, bits of sap green I've done so far. So hopefully you can see that there's now a kind of a diagonal continuation behind those blades of grass that look like they're in the foreground, and you can see blades of grass in the background sort of popping off from the right towards the left diagonally. Now I'm dropping in just a couple of little bits, just a few little bits, because the dark colors are so juicy and, and so full of kind of color, you know, they will swamp it if you use too much. So I'm putting in just little bits of indigo and then blending those in a little bit with the sap green, using the fine edge of the chisel to put a little shadow down the edge um, of that piece of grass. I'm basically just trying to show you there's some of these dark areas in the background that are nicely blended in. And I think the main reason why I felt that this background was actually going well compared to the previous one, the one that I felt was a bit of a fail, was because I just had a clearer idea when I started doing the background this time, the way I was going to draw the strokes uh, and the colors that I was going to use were a little bit more natural. And I had a good idea which ones I was going to use and how they would blend together in order to give me the colors that I wanted. So as I work here from section to section, you should be able to see what I'm talking about with the way that I laid down those strokes of the pen, first of all, to break it up into these manageable chunks that I could do a bit at a time without worrying about the whole thing. And here I've changed the camera angle just for a little bit of variety. Um, so you can see how I'm you know, blending these markers in from a slightly different angle, perhaps a slightly clearer angle, and I'm able to get in a bit closer. So you can see me laying down the sap green base, leaving some white areas that I then fill with emerald as I go through so I know they're going to be shadow areas and then adding that indigo again very carefully a little goes a long way so I'm being quite sparing with how I add it but again I'm trying to add it and blend it with the sap green so that it gives me this idea of depth in the background that some leaves are closer to us that is kind of bending over perhaps then you can see me again doing the sections in the background just doing this section and then I go in and add emerald and sap green and also indigo to try and do those sections you can see me here layering up my colors quite a bit. So I'm putting you know, some sap green on top of already existing sap green and it gives you a slightly darker shade of green. And this works a little bit like alcohol markers, but I do have to say that if you kind of overwork it and you're trying to lay a layer on and work it and work it, it does lift the layer underneath and the two blend together and, and they can actually become a little bit paler where you don't want them to. So you have to use them quite quick and easy, a little bit expressively when you're layering one color on top of the other. Otherwise it can, like I said, just lift up that color underneath and make it too pale. You probably notice that the look on this right hand side is slightly different to the way that it looks on the left hand side. And I think that is purely because I did the um, background on two different days. So I did the left-hand side one day, and then I did the so right-hand part of the background on a different day. And even though I was trying to use the same style, I don't know, it was a different day, a different mood, whatever, it just turned out a little bit differently. It did have slightly different leaves um, visible on the right-hand side of my reference photo than on the left. And part of me is kind of happy with the way that it looks different, but part of me would also have liked it to have a bit more continuity, perhaps with the straighter, more diagonal kind of um, leaves and blades of grass that so you can see on the left-hand side. Um, but that's how it works out when you work from day to day. That's how it's going to be. I really should have finished it all on one day if I wanted it to have all perhaps the same kind of style. But that's pretty much it done, pretty much finished. 
And when it was done, I was so much happier with this than I was with the original one. And I was really, really glad that somebody had encouraged me to actually finish it and not be too scared. As usual, let me know in the comments below what you thought, if you thought it was helpful, if you think there's anything that might help me and do things differently, please let me know. And also don't forget to share and subscribe and check out some of my previous um, pigment marker videos because I'll leave a bunch of links below um, to the videos that I've done so far this year. Thanks for watching.